So uh, my name is Thomas Gustafsson. I'm Chief PKI Officer at uh, Key Factor, and uh, I'm the founder of the EGBCA Open Source PKI project, which is uh, kind of why I'm here. So at Key Factor, we work with the PKI and the certificate management. So we saw already in the uh, keynote here, there was talking about certificates and PKI, etc. So the key elements of digital trust, we, for us, it's PKI, certificate lifecycle management, code signing, which of course is a lot of uh, stuff going around right now in the uh, cloud native uh, forum. And of course, post quantum cryptography, which is uh, what I'm here to speak about today. So how many of you know about post quantum cryptography? Okay, not too many hands, so I'll give a uh, really quick run through to start with. So quantum computers, something that's being developed uh, globally by Google, uh, nation states, etc. So, but a powerful enough quantum computer, which is called a cryptographically relevant quantum computer or a crack, would threaten the cryptographic algorithms or asymmetric cryptographic algorithms uh, that we rely on today for everything, right? The good news is that symmetric algorithms like AES or hash algorithms like SHA-2, they're pretty much unaffected by this type of quantum computer. But uh, all asymmetric encryption algorithms, or public key algorithms, they actually drop to effectively zero strength. So that means anything RSA, anything elliptic curve, or DSA, which means you know, SSL, TLS, SSH connections, digit any digital signatures on code and firmware, even uh, S-MIME for secure email, or even your uh, Bitcoin or blockchain wallet that's at threat here. So I like this picture because it illustrates it well. You know, a crack will bring the security level, as NIST defines it, uh, to zero bits for RSA and EC, for example. So today, uh, NIST defines uh, the minimum security level they would like as they call it 128 bits, and then there's 192 and 256 bits. So today we can see the most popular RSA algorithm is actually only 112-bit security, but uh, if a crack comes around, it's zero bits, which is uh, very, very bad for us. Uh, so the story is basically that quantum computers is coming. So there's you know debate. We don't know when a cryptograph cryptographically relevant quantum computer comes along. You know, some people estimate only in five years, some say 30, 40, or even longer. But that means that there is an unacceptable risk to our, all our current today uh, asymmetric encryption algorithms uh, that we, we can't live with that kind of risk because the time is short. Uh, that means that we need new algorithms which are quantum safe or safe against uh, a potential uh, cryptographically relevant quantum computer. And as we know, cryptographic migration take a very long time. So it's time to start now. And there's a lot of things going on and even regulations are coming up to, to uh, address this uh, threat. And a short timeline. I don't know how many of you know that, but since 2017, NIST has been running a post-quantum cryptographic contest to develop these new cryptographic algorithms that are quantum safe or quantum resistant. So we don't have to go through any, everything that has happened, but actually the last step here, which is July 2024, which is just a few weeks or maximum a month away, that's when NIST will release the final standards for three new quantum resistant algorithms. One called MLDSA, or currently uh, the more fancy name, Dilithium, another one called SLHDSA, uh, currently a more fancy working name by Sphinx Plus, and MLCAM, which is a key encapsulation method to, repl uh, to replace anything Diffie-Hellman or key exchange, or uh, for short, an encryption algorithm currently known as Kyber. So these algorithms are coming now in, in July 2024. That means that the migration is starting this year. And uh, what we have to consider is that these algorithms are different from what we're used to. So in what way are they different? So keys are a lot bigger. We'll see some, an example of that uh, later on. Uh, digital signatures are a lot bigger. So this might be important or it might you know, not affect you at all. So it depends on the specific use case. But 
uh, that's something that needs to be considered. And these CAMs or key encapsulation methods are works quite differently, which is uh, why there is a need for protocol redesign and such things. So just a slight uh, mention on the key encapsulation me methods or mechanisms. So this is the post-quantum cryptographic answer to Diffie-Hellman key agreement or RSA keys transport, which means ECDH or DH or RSA encryption in uh, every TLS connection that we use, right? So um, these work a little bit different. I mean, the end result is the same. You have a symmetric AES key on both, us, both sides that uh, can be used to encrypt the data for confidentiality. But the way they work is uh, quite differently, which means that we can't just you know, plug in a new algorithm in your TLS, current TLS protocol, and it's going to work. Because it will need a redesign or an, an additional uh, function to TLS, which is now is being standardized in the IETF. And the same, of course, with uh, things like uh, CMS messages for digital signatures or uh, uh, things like that. So there's a lot of things that will need to change. So everything actually will change a little. Some ch things will change a lot. So protocols and formats like TLS, like PKSIS 11, will have to change with new algorithm identifiers if they're using CAMs. Uh, hardware security modules, TPMs, security elements will have to change. Sometimes a firmware update will be enough to support new algorithms. Sometimes actually new hardware replacement will have to be uh, put in, in place of, of the old ones. So basically any product that communicates securely over a network or use cryptography in any way will have to change. Uh, so which means cryptographic libraries, you know, open as a cell or uh, whatever, anything you know, built into Go, bounce a call cell, whatever you're using. And in order to make this, uh, you know, change all applications, you have to have an inventory to prioritize what to change first, which is at most risk and such. And I mentioned regulation, so there's of course global, so I'm just gonna mention one, the CS, CNSA 2.0, which is uh, here from America, right? They specify uh, for any vendor that delivers anything to the uh, US federal government, we'll have to change these new algorithms. Dilithium or MLDSA, as I mentioned, uh, or Kyber uh, for public key encry encryption. The symmetric, as I mentioned as well, they will remain the same. But there are quite tight, tight deadlines. So uh, actually, the federal government, when in procurement, will start preferring vendors that have these uh, or migrated to the new algorithms next year. And by 2030, they will buy from solely such vendors. And as I mentioned as well, it's not you know, unique to the US. The Europe and even China will come out with uh, similar regulations. So that's why it's. Uh, the migration will start happening this year and go on for a long time. So the kind of recommendations from a top-down kind of CISO approach looks the same for wherever you look. If it's from uh, you know, CISA here in the US or if it's uh, from ANSI in France, from France or BSI in Germany or wherever you look, it looks about the same. Recommendations are to start now because 2030 is actually not very far away. Get an inventor of your use cases and their exposure to risk so you know what to address first. Inventory what algorithms you are using and where so you can uh, uh, you know, judge the, uh, the value of the data that is protected by this algorithm. And plan for an algorithm changeover. And for manufacturers, post-quantum firmware signing is definitely a must because if you put actually stuff out in the field that's going to live for a long time, you have to update it, be able to update it securely in a couple of years. And uh, last, but actually probably most important, designing crypto agility or updatability for all algorithms, keys, and, you know, device identities and roots of trust. Because this, you know, this migration that's going on now, for these algorithms that I mentioned, it's not going to be the last migration. It's going to continue. It's going to be new post-quantum or quantum safe algorithms coming out, which might be better. So there's going to be you know, multiple migrations, uh, and multiple new algorithms that need to be supported in the coming years. Turning it around, when I speak to you know, IT departments more, then it's more you can almost turn the thing around. You know, still number one, you know, is start now, 2030 is not far away, but then 
actually the most important if you're doing stuff is designing crypto agility and updatability. So that can mean two things. For example, if you're procuring you know, new products, require from these vendors that they are crypto agile and can be able to switch new algorithms in, uh, in the coming uh, near future. Or if you're developing anything, which of course the, the Cloud Native Computing Foundation is developing a lot of new stuff. If it's not crypto agile, the, the new things that are being developed and actually take a step back and uh, stop the development and redesign with crypto agility in mind. This is uh, uh, critical. Still, post-quantum code signing is a must. And uh, if you have, you know, many organizations have an existing data classification, like uh, for personal identifiable information, GDPR or whatever, so you know where your you know, most important data is. So you can plan there for an algorithm changeover. And of course, you also need to inventory for algorithms and keys that you don't know about. So we see this as seized the opportunity. So there's a huge cryptographic migration coming. So take the opportunity to make sure your systems are crypto agile for the future because it's going to make your life so much easier in the, in the coming years. So some things which are, uh, you know, what's the relevance for uh, IAM or Kubernetes, you know, as I mentioned, all TLS or MTLS will change. Code signing will have to have new algorithm. Things like SPIFI identities, if there's, you know, signing uh, JOTs or, or x family certificates, it's going to change algorithms. And of course, smart cards, USB tokens, you know, anything uh, you're working with. So if you see things like RSA, MQV, GQ, or ECC, it's going to involve a design change of the system. And for Kubernetes, yeah, service mesh, speaking a lot about that, because that relies on uh, or uses TLS and MTLS. Things like container signing, uh, SPIFI, as I mentioned, of course, SBOM and SBOM attestations, all of this uh, will have to change. So. If you're uh, using a Kubernetes PKI, you know, a good, uh, well, what we think is good is to offload that to read PKI. It's going to, and uh, like uh, Spiffy or service mesh certificates, there's a lot of, you know, built in components today, which is, uh, you know, have, have kind of had the focus to, okay, we need to get things working fast. And we do that by uh, hard coding some stuff in because, yeah, it, it's going to work. But uh, with the kind of increased number of uh, cryptographic migrations going to happen in the coming decade, it's probably better to offload that to a separate component, a real PKI, where you can just do a configuration change and switch algorithms and not require things like uh, software updates in order to change things to the real thing. So kind of avoid sub-optimization by you know, doing uh, things quick and dirty. Uh, one example. Uh, uh, or two examples that I've seen is uh, GQ signatures, which only works with RSA, has been, you know, as a, uh, like, well, we know it's only RSA, but it works for now. So you might, you know, you're going to have to redesign it anyway soon. And things like uh, hard-coded things in certificates. So this is an example of a, of a spiffy uh, certificate, which comes from a built-in PKI. You know, it has some hard-coded uh, distinguished name, which says US. Not too much to bother about, but it used it on the elliptic curve public key, which is fine, uh, which is really good, actually. But then it has invalid key usage flags, for example. So according to RFC 8813, you are not allowed to have key encipherment key usage on an easy public key. So if you, you know, deploy the certificate and some of your components for, say, uh, your uh, sidecar uh, MTLS proxy, gets a uh, more uh, a, a compliance enforcing validation uh, algorithm or uh, library put in, then it might start rejecting the certificate because it doesn't comply with the relevant RFCs. So these are, uh, and actually you will need a code update in order to change this to a compliance certificate. So, something about a migration plan before we get into a demo. How would that look like? So, there are a lot of things uh, being standardized. And one thing is uh, hybrid TLS. So, likely, you know, all TLS and MTLS connections will uh, start using hybrid TLS, which is for the symmetric key exchange, because you won't, 
what you want to protect against is what uh, in the post-quantum cryptography uh, circus is mostly the, uh, called that the harvest now, decrypt later uh, threat, which means that you can record or traffic is recorded today, but it's protected today, right, encrypted. But uh, when a cryptographically relevant quantum computer comes along, you can de decrypt this traffic. So if you're transmitting sensitive data, someone's going to read it in you know, 5 or 10 or 15 or 20 years. So TLS is now being updated to include what is called a hybrid TLS key exchange, which means one classic Diffie-Hellman, you know, RSA or EC uh, key exchange, and one uh, post-quantum key encapsulation method, or Kyber uh, key exchange, which uh, kind of gives belts and suspenders, because the, the first one, the classic one, would protect if, say, the uh, new post-quantum algorithm would be broken by a conventional computer. We still have the old trusty one. And of, of course, the uh, number two, the uh, quantum safe algorithm protects against a potential future uh, cryptographic relevant quantum computer breaking the first one. So this is uh, uh, something I will demo. And then hybrid certificates, which is uh, actually standardized in X509 standard nowadays as X509 alternative keys and signatures which adds three extensions to an X509 certificate, which is an alternate public key, an alternate signature algorithm, and an alternate signature, which means that you issue a certificate still with your classic RSA or EC uh, public key and signature in it, but in addition, you add these uh, quantum safe algorithms as extensions uh, being non-critical, which means that you can deploy it in the field and any old equipment out there, or any old OpenSSL library, they will understand the classic ones and ignore uh, the new post-quantum ones until they're up updated with uh, something that understands post-quantum algorithms, then they can start using those. So these are kind of uh, migration technologies which are being uh, developed. Or. So a little bit, uh, just a short one about speed. There's a concern, of course, about speed of the new algorithms, but we, if you're running some tests, so compared to RSA or uh, EC of 128 bits secured or, or comparable, the Dalithium 2, for example, which is the post-quantum equivalent of uh, this is a signature algorithm with 128 bits security level, is uh, almost as fast. So this is for certificate issuance. So with RSA 3072, you could issue 800 certificates per second, and with a lithium to 700 certificates per second, which is more than enough for, uh, you know, uh, most relevant 99.99% of PKI use cases out there. And uh, one thing which there is a lot of uh, blog posts out there and a lot of testing has been done is uh, things like uh, the public key and signature size in the TLS uh, chain, which is then exchanged in the TLS, oh, yeah, uh, a certificate uh, chain, which is exchanged in the TLS uh, handshake, right? Typically, the uh, issuing CA and, and the leaf certificate is transmitted as part of the TLS handshake. And uh, if we're having a elliptic curve one on the top, which is uh, the, re the smallest one is really short. If you take the public key and signature size of a key exchange or a certificate chain excluding the root certificate, it's only 224 bytes. And if you take the lithium, which will be the, the standardized replacement, it's eight kilobytes. So it's a huge difference in the, in the size that needs to be transmitted. But depending on your use case, if you're using TLS session keep alive or uh, see, uh, TLS session resume uh, resumption. You don't do a lot of initial handshakes, so you probably won't notice too much. Also, if you have low, a low latency, like in a Kubernetes cluster. But if you have high latency or have to do a lot of these uh, initial key exchanges, you might see a latency or, or speed impediment, which is, uh, is bad. So that's uh, a lot of things. So I want to emphasize again that this is just the starting point of the post-quantum migration journey, and it starts this year. And it's going to be a lot of uh, products coming out uh, this year with new algorithms, and it's going to uh, uh, really take up next year when uh, regs regulations are, are starting to come up. But there will be new algorithms in the future as well, so this is only going to be the first migration. So maintaining crypto agility is definitely a must in what we do. Uh, I can skip this one. 
or well, it's going to be you know it's going to affect everyone. So we think you know maybe it's not going to hurt me too much. But if we take kind of a tentative order of migration, we're going to see governments enforcing migration to post quantum first. And then every regulated industries like financial is working hard on this. Critical infrastructure is also have been working on it for a couple of years. Telecom 6G is going to use post quantum algorithms solely, only. There's not going to be any classic algorithms in 6G net networks. And with the supply chain vendors, I don't mean like the software supply chain, but I mean every other product or vendor which are used by these other guys is going to have to to be updated, which means, you know, in the end, it's going to be everyone. And uh, now to my demo. So I'm going to demo a uh, classic server client uh, communication as well, which we have seen examples of already before. So I'm going to use an uh, Apache HTTPD container and a curl container that talks to each other. But I'm going to use the ones from the Open Quantum Safe project, which is a uh, Linux Foundation project, which implements a uh, provider with post quantum algorithms for OpenSSL and other uh, cryptographic providers. Uh, so it's going to use a TLS hybrid key exchange and a, a uh, TLS server certificate using the lithium. So, of course, a class, classic uh, MTLS uh, use case, right? Because uh, Apache, they also have an, have an NGINX container, actually, so which is classically used as, as uh, MTLS proxies, for example. So the difference from, say, the Keynote, which used a uh, self-signed uh, certificate using OpenSSL, which, by the way, if you start this uh, Apache container by default, it's going to generate a self-signed certificate. But we don't want that because uh, we think that the quality of the certificate matters. So you want a certificates that are rooted in a kind of in, in a real uh, root of trust based uh, maybe hardware security module uh, backed uh, uh, root CA and such things. So we're going to take an uh, EGBCA container and create a Dalithium CA and then put uh, issue a server certificate using a Latium Dalithium from this what we call real PKI and then start the uh, OQS Apache container. So you're going to see that it actually works. It's in already interoperability among different implementations of these algorithms. So let's see uh, if I can get this working. So this is my EGBCA container started. So it has nothing in it, but uh, I'm going to create a certificate chain. So for those of you who know PKI well, we need to know that every, to create a CA, we need first CA signature keys. So I'm going to create the CA signature keys, then I'm going to create the CAs, and then, then I'm going to issue a uh, TLS certificate. Uh, so I start by going into crypto tokens. I'm going to create a uh, PQC root crypto token. And then I'm going to generate the uh, keys here. So I for the root CA, I will generate the Dilithium 3 key pair. I also need for actually a test key, uh, which is the same algorithm that's just used for testing, say, functionality. Uh, and I have an encrypt key, which is an internal uh, uh, key for encrypting some data potentially in the database. We haven't moved that to uh, post quantum algorithms yet, so I'm going to use an RSA algorithm for that. So that's what's needed to create the root CA. I'm going to do the same for the uh, sub CA or the issuing CA. And there. And for the sub CA, I'm going to use uh, Dalithium 2. So it's uh, fast to, to uh, create keys on a, on a good laptop. And the same there, an encrypt key, which is RSA. There we are. Now we have everything needed to create the actual CAs. And by the way, so this is good visualization, but everything that I do here, you can, of course, automate by YAML files and spin up this totally automatically using just YAML files and the rest, uh, rest uh, commands. 
But this is uh, what is done in the background, of course, even if you automate it with uh, YAML and uh, REST. So I create a root CA with the Lithium 3 as a signature algorithm. So then it selects the sign key uh, for certi signing certificates and CRLs. So it's a self-signed root CA. I call it, I give it two years validity, fairly crypto agile for a PKI. Usually root CAs are valid for say, you know, 20 or 30 years. So that's just the root CA. So now we create also a sub CA, or issuing CA. Uh, the sub CA, crypto token that I just created, the lithium two uh, signature algorithm for that. And I would call that this one is signed by the root CA, of course, and one year validity for that. And that's it, I think. Now we have our uh, PKI hierarchy set up. So we can look at the uh, certificate, for example, of the root uh, of the sub CA. So we see that it uh, signed by the root CA, it uses the lithium two public key and uh, signature. So uh, that's all we need. Now with that, we can go and uh, create a uh, uh, web server certificate. So I do that also easily. So I have set up a server profile, which is uh, you know only, which has all the proper key usage and all the extension that's needed by TLS server certificate. Uh, I will have the CA uh, generate the key for me. I have a container which is uh, just have an IP address. So I will put that there. And I will download the PAM file to use in my Apache server. So, okay, we can see that I've done this before to uh, rehearsal. So we'll save it. So that's, uh, that's it. Now we have the, the PKI and the server certificate generated. So then I will jump into uh, the container. So I put, so I unpacked before the, uh, the PAM file, which contains a root CA certificate, which is the trust anchor, of course, which we need. Uh, the sub CA will be transferred in the uh, TLS handshake, so we don't need to configure that for the server. Of course, the uh, server certificate and the server private key. And then I start my Apache or Open Quantum Safe HTTPD server by mounting in this directory with the, uh, the new uh, Quantum Safe server certificate. So it starts up, it goes, Instantly, of course, like uh, HTTP should do. And then I can uh, run this other container with the open quantum safe curl, uh, which then understands uh, the uh, hybrid TLS key exchange and uh, post quantum certificate. So it says, okay, it works. We can only also add uh, verbose to see some more information from curl so we can see that it's the uh, certificate issued by the post quantum CA uh, that's here in the handshake. Uh, so that's how you can do multiple components from different uh, places coming together uh, for a quantum safe MTLS or TLS session. And uh, maybe last but not least, I will finish off by saying that there are great resources about post-quantum cryptography. The IETF, Standardization Organization, have a post-quantum cryptography for engineers uh, draft, which is uh, really good have everything and uh, of course uh, we also work a lot with quantum ready solutions which are open source that you can download the EGBC and sign server as containers or as the source code on, the, on github and you can also spin up things uh, in the cloud if you like everything for for free etc and that's it thank you for listening If there's any questions, uh, yeah, I'll be around and feel free to ask. Otherwise, I also uh, don't want to stand be, uh, between you and lunch, but I hope you uh, see the, uh, the need for crypto agility for the migration. Actually, the, in the cryptographic community uh, at the RSA conference, which was a couple of weeks or a month uh, ago in San Francisco, the, crypto the cryptographers are trying to instill a sense of urgency because they are getting worried about the, the uh, 
quantum computers coming, actually coming in 10 years or so, which is a short time for a, uh, a migration like this. So, but with the, all the, uh, uh, we know that the cloud native has very agile tools. So I'm uh, very hopeful that we'll be able to uh, pull this off in uh, time before all our money is stolen from our bank accounts and Bitcoin wallets. Thank you.